When Nolan was born, he looked just like a typical kid. There was no indication at all whatsoever um, based on his phenotype or what he looked like or any medical issues at birth. He seemed like just a typical kid. And honestly, our other children, I mean, he was our third, uh, they were kind of on, on the later end of the milestones anyway. So like neither one of our older two kids walked until 14 months. So when Nolan walked at 16 months, we just thought, you know, he was a little bit delayed and he was a third kid and he was a boy. And, you know, just it kind of kept being like that for the milestones. So he was always on the later end. And um, even when he wasn't talking, I wasn't worried because our middle son hadn't talked for a long time. And I think when he was around two, he started using some alternative forms of communication. He started using a, an AAC device. So he uses a program called Touch Chat to electronically communicate uh, by pressing images and pictures of things that he wants to request or to say more or thank you, um, things like that. And I think we saw little verbal verbalizations, I guess you would call it, like, you know, things like woof and those types of things. But, you know, as, as Laura was saying, the being able to communicate verbally was, I don't know, I think that was the big first thing. that It was, yeah. So he started with a, a speech diagnosis called childhood apraxia of speech. And once we started using this program, he actually was kind of a whiz at it. Like he could make complete sentences with his talker and we're like, okay, you know, like if he doesn't talk, that's fine. Like we can, we can work with this. Like we have a way to communicate. And then there were just kind of like little things that started, he started to lose skills. And that is when we became concerned. So um, he was doing like the sign for more and he was vocalizing more and a few other things. He was trying to say Darth Vader, he loves Star Wars and some other things like that. And over the period of a week, it was like all of a sudden he just stopped doing a lot of those things. He would start with very sign language vocalizations, touch chat, and then he would wake up the next morning and it was, like a blank slate. It was, it was the oddest thing ever. Um, you know, with some of those things he had learned the day before, had been really good at, those skills were gone. Um, and so I think that's, as Laura said, kind of started the uh, the journey in, in the various different, whether it's pediatricians and these highly specialized and specialties types of, types of doctors, that was the start of the journey. It was, yeah. So af after what Nate mentioned with uh, waking up and forgetting skills, I told our speech therapist that and she goes, you have to do a 24 hour EEG, like something is happening in his sleep. And so we had been in contact with a neurologist. We had seen a neurologist every six months. And so we asked for that and told her why, and she requested one and it was just a normal night. Like, you know, spent the, the night in the hospital, didn't see anything abnormal. He slept all night, um, seemed like just, you know, normal Nolan evening. And I still remember where I was. I was at work the next day and I got a phone call from the hospital. So I was like, well, I better go answer this. So I took my phone into the hall and the doctor called me herself like the next day and was like, your son was having seizures all night long. And I was like, what do you mean? Like he seemed totally fine. He was at peace. I think that's where it clicked though, because kind of going back to why was he forgetting everything that he had just learned the day before or he had mastery of, you know, prior months. This was the, the first kind of answer because we understood that at night, all of those skills that he had, that's why they were going away. His brain was, for lack of a better term, on fire. Um, and, and so I think that's kind of where we started with, is this an epilepsy diagnosis? So we eventually got him accepted into something called the Rare Genomes Project through Harvard. And our whole family um, got our samples collected and sent off to Massachusetts and we, about a year and a half later, because it took a long time to get the results, uh, we got a phone call from a genetic counselor and she said, we found it, it's the rarest of the rare. And I was like, okay. So when he first got this DLG4 diagnosis, um, he's missing five letters of that gene. So it's, uh, it was called a random de novo mutation. So it didn't come from either mom or dad, it just happened randomly um, at conception. Neither of our other kids carry this gene mutation either. Uh, but it, that uh, missing five letters, and then he has an insertion of a random letter, um, causes what's called a frame shift truncating mutation. So once we found that, a lot of things made more sense. Um, this gene impacts the creation of a protein called PSD95. And that one copy of his gene that was mutated was producing zero of this protein. 
Um, when he got the first diag the diagnosis initially, uh, we were told by this genetic counselor there were maybe 40 identified cases in the world. So this was four years ago. Um, I think at this point we're up to 75 now. Yeah, I think as as a parent and you know whenever you have children, you know I, I think you want the best for your children. Um, fundamentally, you know I, I think as a parent you want to fix their problems for them. And I think the, the challenge that we've had um, with Nolan and, and kind of the challenges he has is there isn't a playbook for this. You know, I, I think what my wife is kind of kind of alluding to is just, just the general stressors of raising a family, but the added pressure and added stressors that we have around not being able to quickly diagnose a problem and then create action across that. So I think, you know, whereas in the normal day-to-day -day where, where you want to you know, solve the problem. Um, I think the challenge that we've had is it, it's a lot, it doesn't work like that. Um, it's a lot of uh, what I'll call starts and stops. So um, with Nolan, you know, I, I think he's probably lived in the hospital, what would you say, six months out of his life if you look at the cumulative kind of uh, stays there. But it's, you know, you try one procedure or one medication, you try one doctor or another doctor, um, and, and ultimately, you, you know, I think you just have to um, readjust a little bit. The challenges that we have um, here and, and kind of why Shine Syndrome for us has been so, um, you, you can't say life-changing, but it has been life-changing. Um, whenever you have a rare disease, you know, Shine Syndrome being one of these, what you don't have is the certainty of outcome um, like you may have with, with other things. You know, if, if Tessa or, no, or Morgan, you know, whether it went to get better in cross country or or baseball. You know you can set up instructions, you can work with them in the backyard, and they'll progressively get better. With a rare disease such as Shine Syndrome, you know, you don't have that path. You don't have that certainty where you can kind of focus in on certain dynamics and, you know, eventually the child will come along. So it's a lot of start down a path, whether it's meeting with the various doctors, um, different types of medication. Nolan's had, you know, many different surgeries. Um, and, and none of them have kind of, what I would say, solved the problem. It's, and, and I think for us, that's the realization that you have to have eventually is there may not be a, a solution that brings your child to, to, to kind of get to an outcome that you see with your other children. And I think that took a long time for us to be okay with that. Um, I, I think, you know, at first, I, kind of going back to, you want to be solving the problem, but I think it's, it's really shifted on, you know, the goals of the foundation, building a community, advancing research, and making a life just a little bit more comfortable for some individuals that come behind us. One can almost think in terms of, a, of the human body as being a large sort of Lego uh, model and PSD 95 is a very important piece of, of Lego uh, within the nerve cell and it connects with a number of critical other uh, uh, Lego parts which um, allow the, the neuron to, to function as it should. The, the real uh, connection within uh, the, the brain is something called a synapse. It's where one neuron talks to another neuron. And that really is when we're remembering something, thinking of something, uh, having dreams. It's the synapses which are firing. What uh, uh, DLG4 encodes is the postsynaptic protein uh, uh, called PSD95, which is that piece of Lego on the other side of the synapse, which brings important uh, um, Lego parts together so the neuron functions well, so the synaptic connection works well. When you don't have that synapse uh, connectivity, there's some difficulties with uh, expression, some difficulties with memory, and other cognitive issues that come uh, when you don't have as much PSD95 as you normally should. It's frustrating when you don't have answers as a parent, and so you go to therapies. You know, we went to 
everything they tell you you do, you do. You're like, what, what therapy do I need to go to? How many times? How much does it cost? I don't care. You just, I'll do whatever it is. It's my kid. And you just start realizing, you know, um, there, there's not like a process to say, well, hey, give, give us every test out there and tell us what's wrong with our child. Like, that's what you want to say. And we kind of did say that a couple times. And they're like, well, don't, you know, we don't want you to worry. There's a fragile X test, you can, a genetic test. There's this other genetic test you can take. Every time you pay for a test and they give it to them, then they tell you, oh, it's negative. He, he doesn't have this. He's fine. And so like part of you is like, oh, good. And then you're like, well, wait a minute. I just spent $500. And I still don't know. I just know he doesn't have this. And so it was starting to get frustrating because those tests are not quick and you got to wait months in between results. And so we started talking. and we're like, We've, there's got to be a better way to, to do this. And um, we actually found out about a test called a whole exome synchronization. It's called a West test that our niece, um, our niece had that enabled us to find out, you know, a condition that she had. So we reached out to the, the doctors and asked and like, well, we really don't like to do that. I, I think that test is like, I mean, it's very, very expensive because it tests like almost every chromosome. And so um, it took us at least a year, I think, from the beginning of our conversations through them finally saying, okay, we're just gonna let you do this test. And so that was, and then COVID hit. So. Oh, yes, that's right. So, so they COVID approved it. delayed it, yeah. So they approved it, and then COVID hit, and then all of a sudden you couldn't go in, and it's it's DNA stuff. So it's, you know, they, they take, you know, blood, blood draw from from the parents, obviously us and, and our son. And uh, so by the time we finally got it taken, then you have to wait. It was like six or seven months for the results. And so this whole time we're just waiting, but it was probably the best thing we did. Um, and, you know, finally last December is when we got our results. So we found out, you know, he actually has two, what they consider ultra rare um, d disorders. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, so he has the shine syndrome, which is ultra rare. I think, like Justin said, there's like 73 or 74. The best thing I, the best way I can explain it is his reactions to things are not what an outsider, including ourselves, would view as rational. So um, if, if I hear a loud noise, I may, you know, hold my ear or think, oh, that was loud, you know. Whereas um, what I've learned is loud noises to Jace actually mirror physical pain. So if I think of it that way, and it's like a loud noise to him may feel like somebody punching him or him touching a hot stove or something. So his reaction to that is what it would be if he was actually getting hurt. So what do we hope to, to get out of the research that can you know, potentially impact Jason's life? I think the big thing for me is it would be great. I mean, there's, I mean, we just want him to have as normal of a life as possible. So in any way that could be, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different therapies that are helping him now. Um, but, you know, if there's ways to, I don't know, make some of his things that bother him less intense or, um, I don't I mean, regression is the scariest thing because, you know, he keeps learning new words, he learns new skills. And I think if there's something that came out of the research where they could stop or stunt, whatever it is, so he has it, but it doesn't get more severe, doesn't get worse. I mean, we're very lucky he doesn't have the type of seizures um, right now, uh, and, and I, I pray and we pray that he never gets those, but we do see that's a, that's something that is pretty common that he'll probably get one day. But I guess if the research could lead to ways to just kind of help impact those major aspects of shine, that would be my hope. And, and also really just the research, the more attention that it gets, even if there's not like major breakthroughs, it's like just the awareness, because I mean, I've never heard of this. Like you, I remember at one point they thought he had cerebral palsy that, that kept getting thrown around when he was really little. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows what that is, right? So when you research it, or if I say it to a group of people, like, okay, got it. Like maybe one day, who knows when that'll be, you could say shine syndrome and they'll be like, okay, got it. You know, and, and that seems forever away, but I think that would be. Yeah, and even just, you know, even for, and our, we had an appointment at Children's and with the geneticist this week, and she said, life in 20 years is gonna be so much different in genetics because of the technology. So also like our hope is just uh, 
for other kids, you know, like who, you know, you know, down the road, we hope that there's research and our group can keep moving forward. And um, well, to that note, I think when I think about the process we went through with genetic testing, there was there's a, like a list of genetic tests that you that they pick from, and they're like, well, go get this one, go get this one. Shine's not on there, right? I mean, there's 73 cases in the world, and I think what is it, 200,000 cases or less is considered rare, I believe. So if you think about that number, 200,000, and that don't quote me, but yeah. it's around there versus 73. The likelihood of Shine ever getting on like a list to go get a test, probably not likely, but just the awareness, maybe more doctors will learn about it. So when they see symptoms of it, they can say, oh, maybe we should test for this because I've got these other 100 cases where it started like that. Because right now it's, it's kind of luck of the draw that they get approval to do a West test because they pushed on it with their insurance company or their doctors for however many years or months, then they find out. Like there's probably so many people that have it right now that have no idea um, because they've never gotten approval to go get this test. So I, I would hope that comes out of it too. What, one of them is in, we now live in the era of precision medicine uh, where we, we can actually edit our genome. Uh, as we know, we hear about CRISPR, et cetera. And so a means of actually turning up the normal DLG4 gene so that it makes more of the PSD95 is another approach that I think in the next two to three years might be coming along. As well, uh, Dr. Toomer in, in uh, Denmark has her own unique approach uh, uh, for DLG4 therapy. So there's, a, there's any number of promising approaches can you tell me what it's like to have Shine Syndrome? I feel bad because my brain won't let my body do what it wants it to do. And how does that make you feel? Sad. Sad, yeah. There were red flags with Emily ever um, since I can remember. So right after she was born, we noticed that she seemed uncomfortable and would kind of cry more if we held her a certain way. So, so much so, I actually took her to the doctor and had them check. I thought maybe her shoulders or her arms were hurt during uh, birth and she was fine. So looking back now, I realize that it may have been sensory issues. Uh, she also had a really bad skin infection when she was young and was on quite a bit of antibiotics um, under year one. So we thought maybe she was missing milestones because of that. It turned out um, we took her to the doctor, they did an MRI and everything came back fine. Uh, she started physical therapy mainly because she was still unable to sit independently on her own. So between six to nine months, uh, she would just kind of fall over. She had no strength in her trunk and uh, couldn't sit up at all. So the physical therapy helped. Um, she never crawled uh, and then eventually walked, but it was late. Um, and then once she started walking, we realized things like she was afraid of stairs, she was afraid of curbs. Um, so we thought something may have been wrong with her eyes, with her perception. So we took her to the eye doctor, that came back, everything was fine as well. Um, again, so it just went on with missing milestones and I recall her um, thinking, oh, maybe she's colorblind because she wasn't learning her colors. Um, then to find out there, there wasn't anything wrong uh, there with her eyes. So um, from then on, it was years of doctor's visits with pretty much no answers. The only real help we had was from behavior health. So we had a really cool doctor that kind of understood that uh, Emily was unique and didn't fit into a cookie cutter, you know, diagnosis. So she really kind of advocated for us and pushed us to do the genetic testing. So we did the first round of genetic testing that came back clear. And unfortunately we waited about a year and a half before we did the second round. Um, in that time she had started preschool, she received intervention, she received um, PT, OT and speech therapy as well. And uh, she was progressing, but at a very slow, slow rate. And the older she got, the more it was kind of noticeable that things were, were, were off and that she was struggling. So um, we ended up uh, taking her back for the second round of genetic testing. This was just really 
not that far away. So it was in 2020 when we took her back in and they found that she had the DLG4 mutation. So everything started to make sense. So I went in, they told me that there were 40 um, kids that they know of that had it, that there was one Facebook group and one medical paper. So it was kind of overwhelming to hear that, right? And so they said that um, she was likely to have epilepsy, scoliosis, intellectual disability, and possibly um, a heart condition based on the paper that, that they had available to them. So we went through a line of tests and lo and behold, she had all of them and they were all previously undiagnosed. So this genetic testing was like huge, right? Knowing <clears throat> what it was, and even though there wasn't much information on DLG4, just kind of finding an answer was very relieving. You know, there's not a handbook or a playbook for DLG4, and I think that's why it's important. Like I said, knowledge is kind of power. So I, it's a fine line constantly, and, you know, causes the whole family kind of anxiety. Or Are we pushing her too hard or not enough, you know? We want her to to be the best person she she can be and do the things she wants to do, but we don't want to um, push her too hard. And there's that's why I was so happy when I found the Facebook group because there's other moms out there that feel the same way I do. That there's so many unknowns and every case is kind of unique, even though they are so similar. Um, just how to have so, like a, almost like a support group for that is very important as well. Um, when I found out that there was a um, organization being made, I, I, just, I can't even put into words how happy I was. Um, you feel like there's a place for you and that people care um, and that someone's trying to do something because you feel so helpless as a parent um, not being able to do anything and you think, okay, you know, strength in numbers and you feel like someone else understands and that um, that there's hope. Yeah, and I, I don't just think of Emily. I think of kids that are gonna come up after her and they're gonna be misdiagnosed and, I, and my heart just breaks for the older kids who have likely been misdiagnosed and misunderstood, you know? Especially with Emily, if I, I think about it a lot of times, um, there's a regression with the epilepsy that she has, but Emily never experienced that. She was, something was going on from birth. So I'm pretty certain that Emily's had th that epilepsy since she, at forever. Um, and to go nine years without a diagnosis, you know, because no one knew how many other kids went through that when they could have been on medicine, right? That could have prevented them from regressing more or could have changed their lives. So again, the more research we have, um, I think we can do it. Uh, so we're just five years in uh, uh, to this. I mean, uh, there w was a, a paper or two prior to that, but really uh, a Dr. Tumor in, in Denmark uh, sort of herded all us cats. And I, I think there are over 52 of us authors from around the world uh, to, to do really the first extensive case series, and that was three years ago now, three or two or three years ago. So basically, this is early days. We've just more or less discovered the disorder. But with people like the Gervais and other families, there's huge headway being made. And it's often the case, it's the impassioned families who obviously are very affected by this, who are, are pulling people like myself together and, and driving us forward. So it really has been, uh, I've been around the block a few times and seen a few disorders. Uh, uh, this is as fast as any I've seen as far as um, uh, marshalling resources, focusing their scientific sort of goals uh, and, and moving ahead. And I have to say, as far as <clears throat> genes, which have an impact not only with G DLG4 uh, syndrome, but also beyond it, it's a very important gene. And, and I do think that our understanding of how the central nervous system works will really be improved by DLG4 research. And there may even be the potential of some treatment for autism not caused by DLG4 mutations, but a, a better understanding of uh, uh, treatment for autism based upon DLG4 research. Uh, so 
David, well, David was actually very premature. Um, so for his first year, he was followed really closely at the hospital and his development seemed to be normal, accounting for the prematurity. Um, between the ages of one and two, we started to see some delays. So he was late walking and he was late talking, but at the time it just seemed like a normal thing that could have been due to him being premature. And it was only when he got to about age two that we started to see that maybe the delays were more significant, but we still didn't know, uh, we didn't have any idea of a cause. And the major delays that we saw were um, motor skills. He walked when he was about uh, two years and three months. He was he's still using single words at age two. He was talking, though, and, and he also wasn't doing any imaginative play. Um, another thing is he had a lot of trouble with any skills that required figuring out how to do something uh, with his body. So, uh, for example, he'd get to the top of a slide and he wouldn't know how to put his legs out in front of him. So that was kind of how it was. And for several years, we were just doing therapies and we didn't know what was wrong. When he was four, he was diagnosed with autism, which it fit some of his symptoms. Um, so he was quite repetitive in his interests. He liked spinning things. He would talk about the same topics once, once he started talking a bit more, which was around the ages of three to four. But it didn't really explain all of his other issues, um, his difficulties learning, his difficulties with motor skills, and so on. For years, we were just looking, trying to find, you know, a doctor or somebody who would have seen a child like him who might recognize, oh, this is what it is. That's when we started trying to, you know, look for that underlying cause even more because um, we had more you know information to go on with the epilepsy but it still took a long time we had to have a referral to genetics which took uh, over a year and um, at that time when you first get, were referred to genetics they would only do it they would do an initial set of um, things where they tested for well-known syndromes, things like Fragile X or Rett syndrome, and they did a chromosomal microarray. Um, and they, you had to do those first before they'd go to anything more expensive. Um, so we did all of that, and we did an epilepsy panel as well, which looks for genes associated with epilepsy, and everything came back negative. So at that point, it was probably about five or six years ago, mm -hmm. you think? Yeah, At that so. point, they advised us to wait several years before trying um, genetics again, just for, to wait for the, um, you know, <laughs> science to develop more so we'd have more chance of, of, of getting, uh, you know, finding something. So we did that, and then we tried again in, in 2019, and he was able to get a full exome uh, scan and so that revealed that he had Shine syndrome and at that time when we got the um, diagnosis they told us that there were only a few cases that had been diagnosed and but they gave us there was a one paper that they could give us and they, they gave us the you know the report from genetics which had the exact um, genetic variation so that point I went home and uh, <laughs> went on Google again and I I think the first time I tried Googling it I didn't get much and then the second time I tried Googling that and the type of epilepsy he has and that in that way I found uh, Nolan's family. That was that was just so exciting, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean yeah. just to have a concrete diagnosis finally that here is what is is the is the whole issue really just to be able to say yes he has shine syndrome and uh you know the the lot the lack of this protein is causing all these issues is, is uh, uh, was it was very comforting actually i think that so that we finally 
had a uh, had a diagnosis and we could say that this is what's this is what's going on here and because then you can start to get the doctors to do things rather than having an unknown thing going on now you can say well he's got this so now it's likely to cause these issues so now what can we do about it uh, and it gives you a much more it empowers you quite a lot gradually more people are being diagnosed with with shine and um, so more people are, are joining the uh, the dlg4 facebook group every i won't say it's every day but right. it's uh, it's close to that isn't it now so quite a lot. So it's, it's interesting that we're seeing more families in various parts of North America and uh, South America and Europe. We're certainly seeing a lot of. We um, haven't had much contact with people in the Far East yet, but they must be there. It's just obviously communication difficulties and like maybe language difficulties and, and so on but um, you know there must be more parents out there who are doing the same thing and wondering what's going on and uh, as soon as as soon as we get a diagnosis then we can start to compare notes and it's very interesting that the treatments that David is on are or quite common the combination of drugs that he's on is actually quite common for controlling epilepsy and some of the shine syndrome people have much more profound issues with the epilepsy than david did and so it it actually helps i think to give them a clue as to what drugs to try because when you're treating epilepsy, they have a list of drugs that they try, and we try this one, and if that doesn't work, we try this one, and then we try this one, and it takes a few months to try out each one, whereas if you have a diagnosis that says Shine syndrome, and people with Shine syndrome resp respond well to this, this, and this, then you can immediately say, right, let's try this, this, and this, and see if we can get the epilepsy stabilized, and. Um, so, it, so it's very interesting, the exchange of information between the parents and then hence the physicians, I think is very, very useful. There, there can also be a, a tremendous variability, uh, as you know, between the various uh, children with this condition. It can be quite severe and affect them at a very young age, and yet there are others with milder uh, versions who, can, who are actually uh, verbal and, and can talk. Why that is, we need to do more research, we need more funding for research to really work it out. To some extent, it's the mutation in the gene itself. It can happen where it doesn't affect the function much, and it's in a quiet area of, of the protein, so to speak, and it doesn't matter much, there's a mutation, and it, and versus the more severe ones where it, it, it really either shortens the protein to nothing or it really affects it profoundly. As well, it's just one in 19,000 genes, and so it interacts with many other genes, and so there's other factors which impact the severity as well. So, how does the Shine syndrome impact Cypric? That's a really big question, I guess. It, I mean, as the Shine syndrome is an acronym, which stands for a, a variety of symptoms that all of our kids kind of suffer from, but in general, I would say that it impacts pretty much every aspect of his life and in a lot of ways most aspects of our lives as well. Um, probably the biggest challenge that we've found in recent years had, has been the epilepsy. The seizures have been a pretty big challenge. Um, thankfully in recent months we have found a, uh, a, a cocktail of, of drugs that actually seems to work to control his seizures. But that's one thing a lot of families are really struggling hard with. That's probably the, the, the biggest impact. But um, other than that, um, it just makes our lives very unusual compared to what most people live day to day. I think in terms of like how Shine impacts Cédric specifically, um, 
so he was born, we noticed delays in every area of development. So like, sitting up came a little bit late, walking came like two weeks past what the health unit tells you it should. So like 18 months and two weeks kind of thing. Um, so everything was delayed, language was delayed. He didn't really mimic. Um, so it, it, uh, it impacts him in that he has developmental delays in every area, gross motor skill, fine motor skill, language. Um, and then it also um, makes him a really hyper little guy. So a lot of hyperactivity, attention deficit. So getting his attention is difficult. When he's not doing something, you never know if it's because he can't or because he's just not paying attention to what you're asking. Um, and it also caused for him a pretty severe intellectual disability. So he is now 14 years old, but he functions still kind of like, a few years ago, it was assessed at one to two years old. It hasn't really progressed that much. So I'd say it's around the functioning of a two-year-old child in a 14-year-old's body. Um, and then, yeah, like Dave was saying, the, uh, the epilepsy was the latest uh, big challenge that started when he was nine. Um, so the seizures were one of the huge parts on, on how it affects him. Um, and I'll say on the positive part, um, and we've heard that from other families with the same syndrome, um, super affectionate little guy, really smiley, really fun to be around, very social, loves people, so makes it easier to take care of him because he's really lovable and a lot of people really care to, to care for him. But, uh, but yeah, it affects him in every, every area of daily living. He's dependent um, on us for absolutely everything. I'd, I'd say over the years, years ago, maybe the biggest challenge would have been his sleep issues. Um, for a long time, he really did not sleep well. And when people don't sleep well, the entire family doesn't sleep well and it affects every aspect of, of your life. Thankfully, in recent years, he's been doing quite well in, in that uh, department. But I think since the epilepsy started, maybe the biggest challenge was a combination of factors, right? The combination of hyperactivity mm -hmm. along with basically no sense of self-preservation whatsoever. He's got no sense of danger at all combined with drop seizures. So imagine a hyper hyperactive child who has no concept of danger running around and suddenly having a drop seizure. It's basically your worst nightmare. And uh, that's probably been the biggest challenge we've had over the last few years. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Um, it led to a lot of home modifications, yeah. modification of like how we transport him. So we modified the vehicle and then eventually we even modified the backyard um, to make it safe because it was patio stones and drop seizures on patio stones is not um, a fun. And so he wasn't going out in the backyard anymore. So um, yeah, it led to pretty significant changes in the house moving his bedroom down on the first floor, yeah, um, creating and uh, putting his mattress on the ground so that if he falls, he doesn't fall from too high, um, adding a bathroom and it's an adapted bathroom, so an adapted tub so that he doesn't have to like kind of climb over the side of the tub and fall. Um, and yeah, so modifying the, the whole house and then we put foam corners on the on the corners of the walls, removed the dining so our upstairs has dining room furniture scattered in bedrooms all over the place because no hard furniture on the first floor, nothing with sharp corners. Um, so that's They say you can't nerf the world, but we tried pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Really soft carpet. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of different little little touches to to try to make it um, an adapted house that was safe for him to, to move about just what happens as he transitions into being an adult, we don't know is part of the issue. We don't know what services are going to be available, uh, if there's going to be any kind of funding, what the funding is going to be. And it's probably my biggest source of anxiety for the future, just like not being able to plan. We'd like to make sure Cedric is as comfortable as possible for the rest of his life, but how much is that going to cost, right? Do we have to make more modifications to the house? If one day he has to go to a group home, how much is that going to cost? Is that going to be you know, self-funded, et cetera? So trying to plan for the future is very, very difficult. And we pretty much have to just kind of you know, take it year by year and, uh, and see what really is going to happen because we just don't know. Yeah, there are very few older individuals that have been diagnosed because of what I was explaining about how people get diagnosed with those, those genetic um, syndromes and how recently they've been discovered. Um, I think even if we knew what's going to happen to him medically in terms of development, I think we have a good idea that this is, you know, our son is going to be dependent on us for every aspect of his life for the rest of his life. So we know that's our reality. But um, like Dave was saying, I think it's it's those constant 
worries and choices of how do we set up that dependent future? Is it going to be in our home? Will it will it be possible to be in our home? Can we modify our house? Is there some kind of funding so that people can take care of them some of the time? Um, group homes, it's always a hurdle of finding the right one and the right fit and how close to us our choice would be to live with him, you know, forever. <laughs> you, you know, as a parent, you don't want to think of, of your child being taken care of in any worse way than, uh, you know, the best. Like, we want the best for him. Um, and it's hard to imagine someone caring for your child in a better way than you would. I guess for, for any parent who has a newly diagnosed child, I would say one of the greatest things you can do is just join the Facebook group, the, the Shine Syndrome Facebook group. There are so many people there with the same experiences they're going to be having or have already had. It's kind of a nice, um, just a nice environment to be able to just share and ask questions. And everybody seems to be very, very kind of, you know, very generous with their time and, and their, their explanations. So that's the first thing I would say. And I guess depending on where you live, access to services is going to be you know, a challenge accordingly, but that's going to be you know, just kind of gear up for that fight and, and realize they're going to be the, the, the biggest advocate. Nobody else is going to, going to do it for you. So I would say those are the first two things that you probably try to do. And um, yeah, and even within the kids who do have Shine Syndrome, even though many of them have the same kind of symptoms or very similar symptoms, there is a pretty big spectrum on how severe or they might be for each child. So it's difficult to know exactly where each person is going to land, but uh, just by being able to see all the different people who currently have it, you have a good idea of what to kind of, what to get into, uh, what you might be getting into. So, yeah. yeah. And then I'd say definitely, yeah, join the Facebook group and reach out and it, you'll find a few people who have a reality that seems similar and people are really generous with sharing their time and their experiences. Um, and then, you know, one thing we are, you know, big advocates of is start participating in the research. So the, the foundation has set up um, kind of collaboration with certain registries where you can go kind of share your child's medical history and behavioral history and we're setting up a second one um, and then there's a researcher in Denmark that we mentioned earlier who's really researching how the gene works and how the protein is affected when there's a gene variant and why it's doing all these things to our kid and what the processes are to then find what we call drug repurposing. So go through medication that exists already, that has been created, that has been vetted, that we know doesn't have bad side effects, and find some that could compensate for what the gene does. Um, but for that to happen fast and efficiently, we need people to participate in the research. So I think when you're part, when you're in such a rare disease, it's, it's called nano rare, I believe, when we're the low numbers that we are. Um, we currently have less than 100 people diagnosed. So it's kind of everybody need to participate if we're gonna get really good data that tells us how to help not only future generations, but that's what's so hopeful that I didn't even expect myself when we started looking at the research. I thought this could be Cedric's contribution for future children like him. He can, it'll be his kind of role to help out others by sharing what happened to him. Um, it's actually really promising and giving us a lot of hope to see that these drugs can affect the functioning of adults even with the syndrome. So I'd say find the, the website, um, the Facebook group, and just if willing and if interested, start participating in the, in the research and knowing that there might, the, the more partic who participate, the sooner we're gonna get kind of a treatment um, for some of the symptoms, if not for the syndrome itself.